please in, um, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Rumanier. Well, I can't tell you how delighted I am to be here, and um, thank you so much, Maki. That was too kind of an introduction, um, I, but I, I really can't tell you. I'm, I'm so excited. Whenever I get a chance to speak about ceramics, um, I'm just delighted. In general, people want to hear about manga, <laughs> and, um, but uh, I remember when I asked to do my PhD uh, uh, with my advisor, um, I was switching from archaeology to art history, the PhD, and my professor told me, I'll tell you what my professor told me. They belong in the kitchen or under the bed. <laughs> but in fact, um, I will show you today that they are in the British Museum. And they belong very prominently in the British Museum. And what I'm hoping to show you today is another type of archaeology, an archaeology that's above ground, an archaeology of documents um, pertaining to these ceramics. So the ceramics too, but really more about the documentation around the ceramics and how they were collected to show you how we can relook at Japanese history, how we can relook at Japanese ceramics, how we can relook at what we call Japanism, and relook at the way that there is an understanding of Japanese ceramics in the West, but also largely of Japan, what was going on. And it actually turns out to be much more complicated than it appears. But I'm very, very delighted to be to come here um, to the Center for Japanese Studies uh, and at the University of Michigan. And um, I've heard so much about it, and uh, it has such a prominent position. I'd really like to thank um, uh, Jonathan Zinker for asking me, and um, and for Jane Ozanich for arranging it and making it so easy to come. I really, um, I, I can't tell you, I'm delighted. And yesterday, I saw some beautiful things in your museum, um, really fantastic, from Jomon to contemporary. You really are very lucky here. Um, to have those, and I hope you'll take the opportunity to go and look at them and actually start to look at how they came in, why are they here, who collected them, um, and if they're Japanese, why and why did they give them here? It's, it's, they tell so much more about the objects. Objects really have biographies. We all know that, but particularly with ceramics, um, this is ever more important. And um, it, as Maki said, and uh, she's incredibly generous in her introduction, but uh, I do 3D at the British Museum. <laughs> the British Museum, everything is, every department is, every uh, department is sectioned into 2D and 3D. And um, that's how the world is divided. And um, what's fascinating is that 2D in Japan has been dominant pretty much for the 20th century. And uh, 3D has, has been protected and slept in beautiful, um, careful uh, um, in their boxes and in, 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 the, in the archives. And in, uh, but there hasn't been much work on them. So what I'm showing you today is new research, is um, research that is in progress. It's not finished. Um, but um, hopefully, and if you have any ideas or if you have any suggestions, I'd really love to hear it. Um, hopefully, it will be finished by next year. And the British Museum is incredibly committed to online resourcing. It's called Merlin, and anyone can access it anywhere. But what you have to do, this is the key, when you go into Merlin, the D British Museum database, which is truly um, advanced, you have to do the advanced search. If you do not do the advanced search, nothing will come out. But once you do the advanced search, then the world is open to you. And, um, and you do that, and hopefully by this time next year, but maybe before, all of the documents I'm showing you, I hope will be on there. So, so we're slowly putting everything online. Um, all the objects are online, but uh, the information about them we're adding. So, so um, with that preface, I would like to start. When, when we talk about Japanese ceramics, um, and in particular, we often think of them when they're made. Uh, you know, this ceramic was made in 1610 in Arita. It's one of the earliest ceramics. You can think that in its point of production. But what I'm showing you today is more about the journey. And the journey is continuous, and I'll show you that in one example. But I just want to show you in position, um, we're going to be talking about a very specific period of time the 1870s, basically, 1870s to 1880s. This is very important because it's the beginning of the Meiji period, 1868. A number of things are happening. Japan and England has a very close relationship, and this also involves France and certainly Americas. So it's almost like a new world has opened up to Europe for collecting. But before we look at that, I need to look at the role of ceramics. Because as I gave you the little anecdote that was told me at Harvard, um, in fact, uh, uh, the role of ceramics has changed incredibly 
what we look at now in art history, and I wonder how many in the art history department here actually study ceramics, probably none. Um, you know, it's a very, in archeology span people would study it, but in general, it's a very understudied field. Um, decorative arts in general is not studied academically except at Yale and a few other places. Um, it's at the purvey of the museum world. But that actually wasn't the case in the 19th century. Ceramics had a very important role for industry, for um, national identity, certainly for England in its um, Stoke-on-Trent, and also in the society. And this, this um, article from Punch, from um, the second year of Meiji, 1869, I think is actually um, really pertinent. If we look at it, it's the Sunday question. We have the family, the man, the wife, and you don't see the child here, but here you see the man, the wife, and the child. And the public house or the house for the public. So are these people in the bar or do you show them ceramics? <laughs> this is in the South Kensington Museum, I imagine, uh, but um, do you show, or perhaps the British Museum, do you show them ceramics and educate them? So co by coming to a museum, and we're looking at the role of the museum and looking at the role of ceramics in the museum, what are you doing? You're raising, you're using people's new leisure time raising them, raising their consciousness. So we're looking at the role of ceramics today um, in the museum, in the talk today. Um, this is a slide I particularly like because um, it, it was taken in 2002 and it shows two things. One, this guard, um, they, they really run the British Museum. <laughs> and there are a thousand people working in the British Museum and the guards really have the power. <laughs> and, um, but they're really lovely and this man is particularly lovely. But I want to point, this is the front of the British Museum. My, I'm sure many of you have been there. If you haven't, you have to come and visit, but I was particularly pleased because I did this exhibition called Crafting Beauty in Modern Japan, and it was about contemporary Japanese crafts. It's the first time that the British Museum had a contemporary Japanese exhibition, actually besides for a few contemporary um, uh, print shows and, and painting shows, and but this was in the great court, and it caused a huge sensation. At first, they didn't want to do it, but it caused this huge sensation, and from now on, it changed collecting policy, and we are now con collecting contemporary living national treasures and crafts and things like that. But it, it, I'm looking at the role of craft and particular ceramic at the British Museum. Um, these are the newly reinstalled Mitsubishi Corporation, <laughs> Japanese galleries, and um, in the 20th century to 21st century area, in the center is called the Crafting Beauty. We call this a Crafting Beauty case. These are living national treasures. We have Tokuda Yasukichi III, um, Imaimon. Um, we'll see his studio later, and Kakimon Sensei, Inoue Manju. You know, anyway, they, we have contemporary crafts now at the British Museum, so it's part of a living tradition. Now, you could say this is new, but actually in the 19th century, this was commonplace. In fact, this is what happened. You had contemporary objects that were coming in. We tend to forget that. But saying about contemporary objects, I wanted to show you this fantastic piece, which actually I found when I was first working with um, Tim Clark, who is a brilliant man who runs, who heads the whole Japanese section. And um, I was going through the store, and I found this very odd pot. And um, immediately I knew it was early Jomon. Um, and it was complete. It, you know, you, it's very rare to get really complete Jomon pots. But if you notice something really a little bit odd, you see it's got gold. Actually, what it is is a misusashi. It's a water jar for the tea ceremony. And what someone has gold, um, uh, painted gold and then lacquered and then made a lid for it. I don't show you the lid here. The lid is really rather hideous. And then, um, but the, <laughs> we conveniently keep the lid away. <laughs> but, uh, but, but what um, this is, is basically a um, object from Tohoku that is early Jomon, so, you know, about 5,000 BC, um, early to early middle Jomon, that was dug up um, and in a farmer, most likely in the Bakumatsu, so mid 19th century, maybe early 19th century. And someone looked at it and said, oh, we can do something with tea. So they made it into a tea jar. So it's an ancient object that's been reused in the 19th century. Then it was bought by um, Alex uh, von Siebold and um, Philip Franz von Siebold's son who then sold it on to our hero today, Augustus Wollaston Franks, who we'll talk more about. And, um, and so it went into the British Museum as an object of ancient Japan. Augustus Wollaston Franks gave a talk. He was the head curator of the British Museum in 1868, the first year of Meiji, on the Japanese Stone Age to the prehistoric conference in, in London. So there was a huge interest in ancient Japan 
in the early Meiji period, and as a result, Japan obliged and made many fakes of, of, the, of the ancient objects. So we have actually some of those too, um, but this one is real. And uh, what's fascinating is it's just been reborn because it's um, included as one of the 100 objects of the the uh, History of the World in 100 Objects that was done by the director of the British Museum, which is a brilliant book, the BBC radio show and book. And this represents one of the four objects of Japan. And so it has a new incarnation, and um, which is much more than its original purpose. So we just see various um, objects. And I want to just use this as kind of a litmus for our talk. Now we get to um, the British Museum. Mm. And you probably all know how the British Museum was founded, but um, there are two things that are very important. And since I want to go through a lot of things, I'll, I'll speak rather quickly. I don't want to keep you. I want to keep to my 50 minutes, so I want to be very careful. But I have a lot to show you. Just need to set in your mind the British Museum. I don't know how many of you know this, but it was founded in 1753. And it was founded by a man named Sir Hans Sloane. He's this gentleman right here. Sir Hans Sloane was an amazing man, and when he died, he had 71,000 objects himself. But he had a very intricate relationship with Japan uh, in two ways. Um, firstly, he made his money through hot chocolate. He um, actually developed uh, using hot chocolate was popular in the um, in the early 17th century. Uh, in, I'm sorry, late 17th century to early 18th century. But what he did, um, and it was it was very bitter. What he did was added sugar and milk and said it was good for you. And since he was a doctor, everyone believed him, and said it was a digestive. And men in particular used it because they put rum in it. Uh, no, I'm sorry, gin. They put gin in it. And at that point, there was a kind of a movement against gin. So they would hide in the hot chocolate the gin and then drink it in the coffee houses, which were coffee houses, <laughs> but in fact, <laughs> you know, just really basic early pubs. And so um, he made a vast fortune from that. With that vast fortune, he bought collections. One of the collections he bought was Engelbert Kempfer's collection, who was a German doctor. It was a doctor. He liked doctor's collections. And he bought it from his widow and nephew. In that had the manuscripts in German of a history of Japan. It wasn't published yet. And he bought that. He paid a Swiss man, a boy, to translate it into English. This man did it and then died of the first case of karaoshi. He died of the exhaustion. So literally, at the year that it was actually translated, this poor boy <laughs> died. But, but a, his, he, Hans Sloan paid for it to be published in a two-volume book. And that's the first time that the word closed country gets used. In English, it said closed country. It, was, it went through 10, vault, 10 reprintings in 10 years, and it was translated into Dutch. The Dutch East India Company brought it back to the Tokugawa shogunate. They, this has been studied by many Japanese academics. It's not my research, but uh, um, the, ja they translated the word closed country into sakoku, and then that term gets used from there. So it, it's interesting that it just has a tie up to the British Museum. Um, these are some of the things that he bought from Engelbert Kempfer's collection. Um, if you look, this is a, first, this is, uh, a fantastic ware, which m many of you may not know. It's called Utsutsugawa. Many Japanese don't know about this ware. It's in Sasebo. It's, um, it's brilliant, and it's only made from 1690 to 1720, and although there's a contemporary revival of it. And this is the oldest known example of it in any collection. We know it came in. Um, you know, from Engelbert Kempfer, including also this koro, this silver and gold decorated um, incense burner uh, from Japan. So these objects were in the British Museum in 1753 when um, Sir Hans Sloane uh, gave it to the nation upon his death, and, um, and including also um, Engelbert Kempfer's paintings, which this is now in the British Library. Um, you may think the British Library is separate, but originally when the British Museum was founded, it, British Library and the British Museum were together, and the library was on top. The head was always the chief librarian. The second material objects were always second. Um, and it separated in 1973, uh, and then in 1997 it physically separated, and now it's it, now some objects, which this was originally in the British Li Museum, are now in the British Library. So it's rather random what's in each one. But today we're going to be talking about Augustus Wollaston Franks. And he's particularly important for the British Museum because he was the head curator there um, for really the second half of the 19th century. He was responsible for the Oriental Department being founded. 
He was responsible for collecting Japan, China, Islam, but his real passion was archaeology, so he did everything. He was just an incredible man. And his first job at the British Museum was to catalog Sir Hans Sloane's collection. So he physically went through M. Goldberg Kempfer's objects. He went through all of that and cataloged it. What's impressive about him, though, is not just um, his longevity at the British Museum. He started in 1851, and he retired in 1896. Um, and he died the next year, um, you know, so, uh, so his whole academic life was dedicated and his whole second part of his life was dedicated, most of his life was dedicated to the British Museum. But it's more what he represented. He was incredibly wealthy. And in the 19th century, we may think working at the British Museum is a good thing. <laughs> I, I'm happy being there, but to be honest, in the 19th century, it was not a good thing. You know, people who worked for a living were not gentlemen. They, um, you did your amateur societies. You would go to the British Museum. You would consult their objects. You might even donate things to the British Museum, but you did not work. Um, and he, this man right here, um, Sir Augustus Wallace and Franks, was actually incredibly wealthy. He was hugely wealthy. He came from a very, very posh family, and so there was no reason why he had to work at the British Museum. But he was a very particular person. There's only been two photographs ever made of him. And do you see this heavy beard? He had chicken pox when he was a family, when he was young, and his, he, he had just had all these complexes about his family, which I'll explain. And I just want to explain a little bit about him, and then you can kind of see what he did. Um, he, he was incredibly wealthy, but he had chicken pox. He didn't like his visage, but he had a, quite an ego. He knew he was intelligent, <laughs> but, um, but his, so he just wouldn't allow himself to be photographed, but he was there. He was present. He was there. Everything that we think of, Franks was basically there. He was in all the societies. He was head of the Society of Antiquaries. He really was everywhere. But when we look at his birth, he was born in Geneva, which is very odd for an English gentleman. Why was he born in Geneva? Well, he was born in Geneva in 1826, and it's because of his father. His father was very high up in the military, and his father married a beautiful woman who he loved, and she died after one year. So he went and married her sister, which was illegal. And um, so he had to leave the country and basically spent his whole life in exile. So he was born in Geneva, grew up in Rome. So his first language was French. He spoke German and Italian and English. The first time he came to England was to go to Eton. And then after Eton, he went swiftly on to Cambridge. His, his graduate uh, diploma, um, when he graduated, he graduated with a book on medieval tiles. He wrote a book on medieval tiles. He was just brilliant and entered immediately into the British Museum where he stayed for the rest of his life. So he had, even though he was English and aristocratic, he just didn't have an identity that was um, rooted in England. He always felt this separation of the illegalness of his parents' marriage. Even though it was legal in Europe, it wasn't legal in England. So there was always this little bit of a complex about him. And I think this is in part why he de dedicated his life to building up collections for the nation. I'm going to look just at his Japan collection, but before we get to his Japan collection, I want to tell you just a little bit more about him. So um, we have a quote by um, Dame Joan Evans, whose, uh, whose father was a famous Sir John Evans, who was an incredibly famous uh, archaeologist. And she wrote about him. They were very good friends. Um, she wrote about him. He was a gray, dreamy person with an unexpected dry humor and an incurable habit of addressing himself to his top waistcoat button. These buttons, indeed, served as a barometer of enthusiasm. If he were looking at an antiquity, which he liked very much indeed, he figured the top one. If very much, the next. If moderately, the next, and so on down the scale. There were very few objects of antiquity which failed to evoke a response of some sort, for his knowledge was incredibly wide. So you can just see this voracious, voracious collector. But it wasn't a random collection. And what happened when he died was he b had all of his letters burnt. Um, he didn't want his personal life to be known, which was actually quite common at the time. So it's not unusual. It's not that he was a naughty boy and, you know, and he was trying to hide something. That was actually quite usual. But, um, but I've found, and this is what this talk is about, um, which we'll get to in just one second, is, is the documents 
that the more you dig at the British Museum, nothing leaves. You know, you're not allowed to deaccession without an act of parliament. Mm -hmm. and, um, and papers just don't leave. The ceramics, which I'll show you, have stickers on them from everyone who's seen them and pieces of paper jammed in them from all of the people who have viewed them. So they're, they're actually artifacts in them themselves. So I've been digging around and I've found some amazing things which I will show you. But um, one document, which I didn't find, which someone else found, was um, that he wrote was in a separate place. But it, it, at the very end of his life, he wrote um, what was called, what he titled, An Apology for My Life. This is right at his death. So much for, the, and I quote, so much for the museum and its collection. I think I may fairly say that I've created the department of which I am now keeper, that means head curator, at a very moderate cost to the country. When I was appointed to the museum in 1851, the scant collections out of which the department has grown occupied a length of 154 feet of wall cases and three or four table cases. The collection has now occupies 2,250 feet of length, uh, length of wall cases, 90 table cases, 31 upright cases, to say nothing of the numerous objects placed over the cases or on the walls. So he was justifying his life as to the amount of objects that he collected. And before we go on, I just want to point out this is his book plate right here for the Society of Antiquaries, which was the elite amateur scientific society. And so he would have designed this with all of his honors and everything. And right here, pride of place, is a Kakiamon style Japanese vase <laughs> from the 1680s in the British Museum collection. So I just wanted, Japan actually played a, a pivotal role for him, although he wasn't a Japanologist. Um, when I was digging around in, in some of the books to find him, this is him, his Augustus Franks, Augustus Wallace and Franks. These are his, these are his characters. Um, you know, in the, he, he started collecting, and we'll go through this in a second, but he started collecting Japanese things in the 1860s, but he really went for it in the 1870s. And so Daimyo, these are his, these are his um, thing. And so he says, Daimyo Franks no Rondon. So basically, Daimyo Franks of London. We can see he didn't have an ego problem <laughs> <laughs> right there. But, um, but for the 1870s to, to be studying Japanese, just he never went to Japan. And he'd be studying Japanese to understand Japan wasn't his thing. This was just one aspect of his collecting. But he really was looking for the authentic Japan. And I found a document which, what he believed was the authentic Japan. I, I found a document which shows his thought processes. And this is what we're going to talk about in a second. But this is his grave in Kensal Green. And graves are really important. Um, I don't know if you ever go to go and look at them. But they often tell you a lot more than you know, just say thank you to the person who you're studying. But it tells you a lot. And so if you go here, you see Augustus Wollaston Franks. This says he's a sir. He's a knight of the um, empire. And then the first thing it says is president of the Society of Antiquaries. That is what he felt was his um, work. At the very end, after all these titles, it says, sometime keeper of the British Museum. <laughs> so, you know, British Museum ranked quite low. This was what the British Museum looked like when he left it in the 1890s. So you can see what we're talking about, wall cases. This isn't Japan, per se, but uh, just things put up around and all over. I've been retracing what happened, how he was involved in Japan, and what was his collecting. And um, just to give you a little bit of a, of a preface to this, um, he, he was very good friends with Sir Rutherford Alcock, who was in Japan very early in the um, 1860s. And in 1862, there was one of these, er, 1851, interestingly enough, there was the first great exhibition. It was called the Great Exhibition of Works of All Nations. In fact, it only had a very little bit of Asia. <laughs> but there were some Japanese objects, but uh, very, very little bit of Asia, it was the Crystal Palace exhibition. But the one that really started to feature Asia, and particularly Japan, was 1862. Um, and there was a Japanese court. It was all contemporary objects, but um, Sir Rutherford Alcock set it up, and Franks bought a lot of them, so they're in the British Museum. And um, then I've been just trying to trace, this is 1866, an auction with what is now Christie's, and this object right here, just random European objects, but here we have a Japanese coffee pot. And, um, oh, sorry, I, I had a 
I meant to put, sorry, I meant to, I've been cutting down slides. So we, this is now in the British Museum, this coffee pot right here. So we can start to trace where he purchased these things. And it turns out, basically, he purchased them in auctions, this one also is from another auction. It's fantastic. It's a very, very early export uh, ware from Arita. Um, it dates very, very specifically to 18, to 1650 and to 1660. So this is really early export. We know because of the style and the design, but it's fantastic pieces. But he also went um, to, this is a coffee cup, actually. It's a, you can, I'm sorry, hot chocolate cup. You, they're very, they're so appropriate to the British Museum. They're very tall and slender. Um, but what's important is this mark right here. This mark shows us, and this is Frank's number right here. This is a 1061st object that he collected of Japan. Um, this is Augustus the Strong, um, who was uh, the elector of Saxony, um, who has a passion for Japanese porcelain. Um, this is his marks from the Zwinger. Uh, and so these were, he went, Franks went twice to the Zwinger in Dresden and collected objects directly from there. So he went around Europe and collected objects. These are some of the other objects. This is Kakiamon style objects. They're fantastic pieces. They're made from 1660 to 1690s, really the height of Japanese export. But these were very, very expensive. These were all made for export. Now, Franks wouldn't have known that. He just assumed these were Japanese ceramics and the height of Japanese ceramics. This is another candlestick that he bought. And this is his writing right here. And um, not the pencil. Um, that was done by uh, Som Jennings later on. But the pen is his. And so it, it says it's Japanese porcelain. We know this is Kakiamon style. But he calls it old Imari ware. And we see this, Bing. He bought it from Bing in France in um, the 1870s. And so sometimes he has the prices. Um, for example, this porcelain, which I don't have pictured, is a Kameyama ware, 50 years old. It's true. It, he's right. He bought this in the Paris exhibition in 1878, and he bought it from the vendor named Waki, and we have different prices. So we have a lot of incredible documents of um, what was bought, when, where, how much. But something happened to Franks, and this is the point of the talk. And this is in, in, you know, we could say it's great that he collected Japan, he collected porcelain, that's wonderful. But Franks wasn't just a rabid collector. He was actually not just serializing things. He actually had a commitment to the nation that was the role of the British Museum that really is a stake. What is it? It's a representation of empire, but it's about an authentic representing of the cultures of those countries. It's an authentic reputation. And it's through this authenticity that they had cultural um, capital. It was, in a way, very important to, to be authentic. So Franks, in this quest, also felt not just collecting, but displaying was important. Education, education was important. And so in 1875, he had one of the first exhibitions, I think, outside of Japan of um, Chinese and Japanese ceramics. And, uh, and this was done in, uh, in the Bethnal Green Museum, which is now the Victorian Albert Museum, um, not in the British Museum, but outside of the British Museum, but in a museum and in 1875. Now, you see kind of a fudging here. This is all in his handwriting. It's typical of him. He made his own contracts. We talk about um, having to do everything ourselves these days, academics, but actually he had to do everything himself too. And um, so he did this, and he fudged it right here. He, he, what he did was he adapted it. And this tells a little bit about his, his um, mentality. This is he revised the contract in 1876. And here you can see his revision. So um, basically he's saying that he reserves for the power for rewriting any materials um, that is published, um, and 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 basically, um, and the and the publications, and no, nothing can be rewritten without his consent. So he wants to put copyright on this, but he also what you see is that he was getting new information all the time. So he was rewriting and rechanging things, and he wanted to reserve that. And this is exactly what happened. Um, he must have known this in 1876 when he changed this. This is the first publication right here. It's the Bethnal Green Branch Museum, the collection of oriental porcelain and pottery. It's China and Japan. And uh, this was paid for by the trustees of the museum, basically the Japanese government. And, um, and this is the crux. In the first edition, there are 115 entries for Japanese porcelain and only nine for Japanese pottery. Now, and what he calls Japanese pottery, that means earthenware and stoneware. Now, you may all know the difference between um, 
pottery, um, earthenware, stoneware, and porcelain, but it's very important for this argument. Um, Japan has the oldest ceramic industry in the world so far. Now, it's just because I believe Japan is over-excavated and, um, and China and Siberia and other areas have not been excavated as much. Um, there are 10,000 archaeologists in Japan and um, at the height of the bubble, there were 10,000 sites being dug every year. You know, every section of Japan is brilliantly dug and brilliantly recorded. So really everything is known. Now, in Shiga recently, the oldest dogu figure has come out at 15,000 BCE. You know, so Japan really does have a very old ceramic industry. What's fascinating is Japan didn't have painted ceramics until 1580. And it didn't have porcelain until 1610. Now, China <laughs> had it, you know, in the Tang period. Korea had it in the Goryeo period, you know, so centuries, centuries, centuries before. Why did Japan not have that? Well, that's not the point of this talk, but it's important to know that porcelain is very late. And if porcelain only started in 1610, it was already being exported because of um, problems with export with China by 1650s. So in very quick time, Japan was on a quick learning curve to, to make porcelain. And so what Franks was, was collecting was the porcelain. He believed this represented the history of Japan. Um, and, uh, and so this was, he was very pleased with this. However, something happened the next year. He found out through documentation that actually he was wrong. And so um, he writes in this second re-edition, which he paid for privately to recirculate. It actually dates right here, 1879, but he wrote it the next year. Much light has been thrown on these subjects by numerous importations of old and curious specimens. Curious is good. <laughs> um, accompanied by explanations more or less correct of their origin. The report, however, which accompanies the Japanese collection exhibited at Philadelphia and acquired by the South Kensington Museum has furnished the most trustworthy and valuable information as yet obtained, and I am indebted to the kindness of the director of that museum for the use of the documents, which has enabled me to verify or correct the data obtained by other sources and add considerable usefulness to this catalog. With regards to the marks on Japanese porcelain, I have received the assistance of several Japanese gentlemen, um, especially B. Nanjo, K. Kasawara um, and Mr. T. Baba. Um, what he did is very quickly he collected um, 327, in one year, he bought 327 examples of Japanese pottery and a few of porcelain. And then he wrote um, at, at the end of his preface, for information we are likely to obtain from the work now in the course of publication by Mr. Ninagawa Noritane of Tokyo, entitled Kanko Zusetsu, um, of which, Kanko Zusetsu, of which uh, there are three parts that have appeared with numerous color illustrations and translated into French of the text in the first two parts. And so he mentions Ninagawa, and then later on he mentions his friend Ninagawa. This is the publication. This is the first volume of the publication of the Kanko, Kanko Zusetsu. And what's very important right here is you see in Ninagawa's own handwriting, it's in French. Now, the, I'm talking about Franks in the British Museum, but as a subtext, we have Ninagawa Noritane. Um, I have a rad relatively radical proposal. In Japan, recently he's been rediscovered and um, his photographs of, of Edo Castle, um, you know, with, uh, you know, that he, he took in 1871 um, with Takahashi Yuichi, uh, Yokoyama, um, uh, um, the, the, those have been made into uh, important cultural property. Um, so there's been really kind of a revival and a, almost a little bit of a Ninagawa Noritane boom. I would like to propose that this, isn't, this publication wasn't so altruistic that um, I would like to propose that it wasn't just a pure interest in the history of Japan and one of the first histories of Japanese ceramics. I would like to propose that this was actually an instrument for selling ceramics to Europeans and to Americans. It was almost like a manual for what you could buy and what you could collect. And this was from the very start, was translated into French by Aaron's. Aaron's company in Yokohama was the cousin of Bing. Um, and Siegfried Bing, who was controlling the um, 
you know, what was soon later to be the Japanese boom in Paris, it shows a very careful building up of knowledge of Japan, knowledge of ceramics, knowledge of what people were collecting. It's almost like a foundation and then providing the objects for the Europeans. After they perfected this, then it went on to ukiyo-e, but the base was ceramics. And so this is my preface. Um, this, I just want to quickly show you this, this copy actually, and, and they were limited copies. This was by William Gowland. William Gowland was a great friend of Frank's, and this is a, a self-portrait of him in a Kofun tomb. And we're doing this project of him right now, but he was in Japan between 1872 and 1888 in the British Museum. As a result, Frank's funded him. And, and the Kofun material, a lot of things are misagi that are designated tombs. Um, weren't designated when he entered them. And so he never did anything illegal, but he um, went into wherever he was allowed. He collected Kofun material. The British Museum now has it because Franks purchased it. And uh, so it's, it's impressive. This is Franks' own edition. And I just wanted to show you the difference. Franks never did anything in half ways. He had his leather bound. <laughs> he had his um, gold embossed. <laughs> you know, he really had it quite, um, quite uh, I elaborate. Uh, this is the French version. It came out serially. When he rewrote his, um, his, uh, his volume, only two editions had come out. This is 1877. He was later to say, though, in his documents that the French was, when he learned a little more Japanese, the French actually wasn't an accurate translation. So um, he, was, he was quite pleased with his, his knowledge. These are collections that um, Gowland collected of Sueki wares, of uh, stone wares, in, in, that are in the British Museum. This is a page from the Kanko Zusetsu from Ninagawa Noritane. You can see the drawings are spectacular. I want to show you one more. This is Frank's collection. And see, so he showed the objects from the front and the back. This is not typical for Japanese depictions in the 1870s. Um, Ninagawa, um, and I'll explain about him in just a second, was an incredible person. And he had his own pump publishing company called Rakosha. And um, he published these himself. The English that's all written here is Franks's notes. And, um, and Franks, whenever possible, bought the same object, but mostly he bought objects that were similar. Ninagawa would supply him with that. The objects illustrated here are mostly bought by um, Edward Sylvester Morse and are in the Morse collection in the British Museum. Ninagawa was the source for Morse. But before he met Morse, he knew Franks. So Franks was uh, an earlier connection. And this was all through a man named Ernest Sato. And we will tell you about Ernest Sato's dealings and his literal dealing in Japanese objects in a moment. This is, again, uh, another copy of the Kanko Susetsu. This is, a, this is a page, and you can see the objects right here. And the author is Ninagawa Noritane, this gentleman right here. Just want to quickly tell you about Nina Gawa Noritane. Um, he was from a family um, that was distantly related to the imperial family. Um, his family were officials of Toji Temple in Kyoto. And um, in 1869, he was hired by the Meiji government to, as, as a recorder, and in 1872 by the Ministry of Education. His major um, move, um, his major passion was to record objects ph photographically through rubbings. He went in um, in 1871 and, and started the beginnings of the law of the preservation of antiquities and old properties. He went in and surveyed Issei, the Shosoin, um, with a group of people. And in 1872, with Machida Hisunari, um, he created the Yushima Seido exhibition, which was the forerunner for the Tokyo National museum. So he really did know about antiquities, but he also knew the value of antiquities and really um, what they would sell for and how interesting they were for Europeans. He also, because he, he did a lot of studies, he, he had a very voracious um, appetite for funding and, um, and, and a very weak body. He was actually quite ill, and he actually had to retire early in the 18, um, by 1877, but probably by 1875. It's recorded 1877, but he probably stopped by 1875 because he was just weak and stayed in Tokyo with his publishing firm and then became friends with foreigners to, to sell objects. Um, this is another example of the Kanko Zusetsu, and this is a sandaware, and it, it, there's no porcelain in the Kanko Zusetsu. It's all earthenware 
stoneware. And this was a huge revelation to Franks. He all of a sudden realized all of these foreign porcelains that he had been collecting that he really felt represented Japan were export ware. This was a huge shock for, for Franks. And, um, and so he, he switched what he thought was export to domestic wares. And, and, um, and he wrote, actually, in the second volume, he said, um, since the publication of the first edition of this catalog, I have endeavored to render the collection more complete, especially in the Japanese sections, which were far from illustrating in a satisfactory manner that important branch of ceramic art. And um, basically, he said that uh, that while lacquer, lacquer of the highest finish and perfection of manufacture is desired in ceramic production, a rough aristic uh, ar artistic specimen is far more valued in Japan than one of those marvels of finish admired in Europe. Most of the large, highly ornamented specimens that are in fact, that are in fact made for exportation, exportation and not for home use. So this was a big revelation for him. Ninagawa actually gave Franks the, the hint, and I will show you a document that I found, but I want to just show you, this is Ninagawa's writing, and this is a tea caddy that is in the British Museum. And so here it, it, it basically says what it is, um, and then it says that it's um, 400 years before the date, and he gives the date of Meiji 12, and he gives the month, and then he signs his name. And then there's this mark right here. And this is actually Ernest Sato's writing. And Ernest Sato writes volume two of the Kanko Zusetsu, number 28, the illustration. It's not the exact object. What it is is a similar object. This is a, uh, a depiction of Ni that Ninagawa had someone draw for him, a painter draw for him, of Ninagawa looking at Edward Sylvester Morse taking his collection back to, to uh, America, to Boston. That's now in the Boston Museum, and um, Morse's children. He, he was very aware of the export market. This is Morse himself um, it, giving a lecture. Um, Morse went many, um, a few times to the British Museum. These are objects in the British Museum. And Morse wrote, wrote when he went to the British Museum that he corrected Franks on his nomenclature for tea caddies. Um, what's interesting is Franks records things. This is Franks writing. He says, Morse says karatsu, but over here it says Hayashi doubts. That's Hayashi Tadamasa, and actually it isn't Karatsu, it's uh, Takatori. <laughs> but, um, but so it, 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 it's just interesting when we look at these things. But what happened to me is I had a ping pong moment and I found this document. This is actually Ninagawa Noritane's hand. He's really hard to read. And um, while it looks deceptively simple, you know, you can get through it, you know, but it, it takes a while. I really struggled. It took me a long time. It's on very, very thin, you know, yellow paper. I'm sure it was actually originally purple. And I, I struggled for about a month, and I finally got it. And then I dug a little bit more, and I found the translation <laughs> that actually came with it. I wish I had found it a little earlier. Um, but um, this is actually the translation that was made by Ernest Sato of this letter. And if you would just bear with me, I want to read it to you. It's, it's actually translated incredibly well. Um, I am much obliged to you for the two copies of your collection of Japanese and Chinese pottery, and for the one piece of Japanese porcelain which you kindly sent to me by the hands of, uh, of Mr. Sato when he came to my country. I admire extremely the efforts which you must have gone in order to collect so many pieces as are named in your catalog. The said piece of old porcelain is about 100 years old, and there is plenty of it in my country, to tell the truth. And, excuse my saying so, but it is not particularly curious. I take this opportunity of sending you two bits of old pottery. One is 600 years old and was made in the province of Owari, the name of the pottery being Tojiro, the name of the potter being Tojiro. The other is about 250 years old and was made at Kyoto. Both are older than pa the painting on the porcelain and are very roughly made. Ninagawa Noritane, May 1877, Mr. Franks, Chief of the Archaeological Department, Museum at London. <laughs> so, so this is Franks's letter. Now, to, to go on, this is, and there, I've found, um, these are all unpublished. Um, hopefully they'll be on the web um, sooner rather than later, but I've found about 20 letters from Ernest Sato. And um, some of them are quite racy. Um, this actually includes a, a uh, he, this is only the, the front and the back of the letter. It goes on. But uh, it, he really um, 
disrespects uh, Christopher Dresser. He says really naughty things about Christopher Dresser. But uh, but um, when you go on here, I'll just read you just a little bit. Um, it says, my dear Franks, the second edition of your catalog, that's the rewritten one, arrived um, about three weeks ago, and I've obtained from our friend Nina Gawa all the information that possessed about the new marks. You will see that he contradicts your informants in one or two places. He projects a complete list of Japanese marks and sends you the enclosed sh shape of marks which um, do not appear um, um, to be published. But um, he also says that he is not able to, at present, to explain all of the marks. Um, he goes on and says um, that Ninagawa, who he meets every week, can supply him with anything he needs. He can supply him with any type of ceramic. But after that, if he wants netsuke, if he wants swords, if he wants that, Ninagawa can find it. And so basically, Franks is acting. I, I, this is in 1878. Um, Sato is acting as a conduit, a middleman for Ninagawa, setting him up with supplying the British Museum. Um, we can go on a little bit about that, but we don't have very much time. So I just want to just quickly tell you, um, I, many of you might know who Sir Ernest Sato is, uh, but he was a diplomat. Um, and it's important, um, he's, he's probably more famous in Japan than he is outside of Japan, but he was an incredible man. And he was not a, he, he sounds like an elegant aristocrat, but in, in England at that point, there was really a lot of prejudice, and he wasn't. His father was a German, um, born in what is now Sweden, but of German descent. And he was, went to University of College London. He was an incredible, great linguist. And at a very young age, um, he went to Japan in 1862. He was involved in a lot of the incidents that were happening. And um, he was one of the few people of that period to switch from just being a clerk to actually being a diplomat. He, he very, very rare. And so he, he had a very remarkable um, uh, history. He was stationed in Siam, Thailand, Uruguay, Morocco, China. But he really had a passion with Japan. He had a Jap Japanese common-law wife. Um, they weren't allowed to be married because of the diplomatic service. He had two children, Japanese children. And, you know, so he was an incredible man, but he very, very erudite. He had very specific opinions. But we can also see that he um, dabbled in dealing as well. And what's interesting, just to go back to Franks, and I want to just kind of close up and, and, and tighten up what we're talking about, is that Franks was very concerned with authenticity, as I say. He knew that he didn't speak Japanese. He tried. You know, he learned characters. He tried to read things himself. But he worked very closely with Japanese um, informants. <laughs> and in particular, there were a number of young Japanese who were going to Oxford and Cambridge. And he had a circle of them that would come in and read things for him. Um, two that were particularly close was a man named um, Kasa. It says Kasawara, and he signs his name Kasawara, but it turns out it's Kasahara. And then um, this man named um, uh, Nanjo Bunyu, and these are letters from them. And, uh, and it's incredible when you read these letters. They're in perfect English and truly elegant. Um, Kasahara wrote, um, this was a 20-page document on the tea ceremony for Franks. It's, it's really very beautiful. And this is um, Nanjo Bunyu. Nanjo Bunyu was an incredible man who went to Oxford. They both went to Oxford, and they both were studying Sanskrit. And um, and they were they uh, unfortunately Kasahara, who was very gifted, um, contracted tuberculosis and then went back to Japan quite young and died. Um, but Nanjo uh, continued and was the first Japanese to get a PhD in the humanities in uh, outside of Japan at Oxford. And then he went back to Tokyo, what is now Tokyo University, and formed the Sanskrit department at Tokyo. So he's an incredible man, but he helped Franks a great deal. And so you can see everything was read and authenticated. This is another letter from Kasahara. They, they, it, these documents, some um, which there are many of, are really um, quite elegant. But what else I've found, and I just want to quickly show you what I've found, are documents that I think can shift the way that we're looking at these exhibitions. And was Franks just kept everything. He was, because his native language was French, um, he was one of the commissioners in the 1878 uh, uh, French uh, Exposition Universal. And um, this is in his handwriting. And he went through and wrote all of the Japanese 
um, exhibitionists, um, people who came to exhibit, the potters. And, uh, and then he wrote whether they were um, overglazed, whether they were actually potters. He wrote where they were from. Um, he wrote the family names. And what you start to realize, and you get this picture, that you have the people who displayed, but then you have this whole group of people who came um, in what was called the bazaar, in the people attached to these expositions where they actually sold objects. And, and contemporary objects, and that's what was being collected. So it's hard to trace from what was actually displayed. It's actually the group around the, the displays that most of the dealing was done. Also, just, um, just to quickly tell you a little bit about Frank's, this is another document I found. Japanese wares not in AWF's collection. This is what he wrote. So, it's, so you know, it would be like me saying, uh, you know, manga not in NCR's collection. <laughs> you know, I just, you know, he had a you know, good sense of self. But it's really interesting. He really went for it. You know, Inuyama ware, you know, Shitoro ware, you know, these really kind of marginal wares. Um, Odo, you know, from Tosa, which he did get. And so when he got them, you know, you put a little check. And when Imado, he got a lot. And Asahi, um, you know, it, it, so it's really Im impressive. He really had a laundry list, what he wanted, and he collected it. it, it here, for example, this chaire, which he drew, um, this is in part two of the Kankos, who said he bought this from Ninagawa, and he bought this for 10 yen. So we have these prices. Um, it's the Ninagawa collection right here. And um, this, is, um, this is him. It's got the British Museum print. And the, he bought things from missionaries that were coming back from Japan. So this is from Reverend C.J. Todd, I think, who was in Hokkaido. And he bought wares from him. He also had, this says Remax. I, this was a Japanese dealer. And, uh, and and in paper and and in English and also in Japanese of all the objects for sale, and he bought things from there. Um, I want to just finish up and conclude though with not just showing you Frank's voracious appetite, which cons which basically in the British Museum now we have, um, I'd say three thousand five hundred Japanese ceramics, uh, half pottery, um, earthenware, stoneware, half porcelain, but. It was very much of a living collection. And part of Frank's legacy, and, and just to turn back and just kind of conclude, is that he collected, he wanted to collect ancient wares from Jomon to the contemporary, but he was very much interested in representing all of the kilns, what was happening in Japan at that time, contemporary. And so we're continuing this tradition now. And we're working with many different potters, in particular this wonderful potter who's sadly died recently, but he was from Kanazawa, Tokura Yasukichi III. He was a living national treasurer. And this is him, and he, um, from Kutani ware, and he came, and this is actually in the Victorian Albert Museum before they redid their galleries. We brought him to the galleries, and he did the same thing at the British Museum. And this piece right here um, was considered to be a uh, Kokutani style, an early um, overglazed Japanese made in Arita, 1650s to 1660s. There are many like this at the British Museum. It looked really great. He said, my grandfather made that, and I can prove it. And he did prove it. So um, basically, what it did show is that it's amazing what happened in the 19th and early 20th centuries with dealing. And, and styles were made exactly as the old styles. When these collectors, such as Franks, Ninagawa, all of these new markets were opening up, Japan supplied them. They made fake jomon. They made, you know, whether this is fake or inspiration, I think you have to be careful. You can't say things are fake. He could have made it in the old style. But in the 1920s, his grandfather, Yasukichi I, did stop doing that <laughs> because when he started to get famous, then, then he, yeah, he stopped. So I think it might have been to fool. But, um, but it, it, it's just important to look at history and the kind of repetition and continuings of history. Um, and when we base our artistic analysis on objects that might not be as old as we think they are, we just need to, to, to rethink. And so that's what we've been doing. But it's, but it's fascinating. What's important, I think, is living tradition and to really reassign our ideas of what is authentic. Um, here I've been talking about Frank's collection for authenticity. But actually, authenticity is a flexible word. This is a Kokutani style piece. This is right. Um, it's 1640s to 1650 um, in the British Museum. It's fantastic. This is Tokura Yasukichi III's work. He says, and it, I'm sure this is true, that the colors and the porcelains are identical. He uses the same mineral pigments, exactly the same, the same recipes, and the same porcelain body. What he does is he uses an electric kiln. He fires them to incredible temperatures. He fires them three times to incredible temperatures that you could never get. So in fact, it looks quite different. 
but it is the same. So what is authentic? What is tradition? What is old? Um, it's also important to know about language. The term dental um, is, uh, we translate it as tradition. It doesn't actually work as tradition. In English, tradition is kind of finished. It's set. It's the queen's changing of the guards. It doesn't change. <laughs> they change, but the, tr the patterns don't change. Dental, the dental kogekai, or the traditional Japanese craft association, is about tradition that constantly gets reinvented. So it's living tradition. This is Imaizumi Imaimon, the 14th studio. I showed you an earlier piece by the 13th. Do you see the red right here? This is from the overglaze that was painted um, from here. The people painting in the 18th and 19th century, it just dribbled down with the red right here. But we went in, we were allowed, it's very rare to go into their current studios. This is basically the setup as it was from the 18th century onwards. You have the men working in a certain style and then the women working in another style. It's, it's completely different. We have here, Tim Clark was with me, and we have Imaizumi Maimon the 14th explaining how he does these things. But it's, it's, it's just, I'm, I'm saying this to that for the British Museum, we're trying to look at what's happening and record these things. But it's also about what is tradition and what is real. So um, these are my collaborators, Hiromi Uchida, Ohashi Koji from the Kyushu Ceramic Museum. And this is Frank's legacy with the Nabishima ware, a Kokutani style ware, and um, these fantastic pieces that make us really re-look re at what Japanese ceramics are. Um, the book that I'm writing that uh, Maki kindly mentioned, this is a mock-up of the cover, um, will come out next year from the British Museum Press. It will be literally the 400 year of porcelain, but this is coming out next month. Vessels of Influence. Um, the publisher that I used actually went bankrupt, so it's gone through a, um, a Bloomsbury academic, but it's the same cover, and that will be coming out next month talking about um, ceramics in Japan. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.